Management Chair Tala is truly honored to host the third talk series of E Colloquium 2K20 titled Deconstructing Reality in the Digital Age by Mr Sam Johnson Assistant Professor of St Michael's College Chair Tala Naipunya family is greatly esteemed to be enlightened by such an eminent personality on this beautiful day Mr Sam Johnson Assistant Professor of St Michael's College has several publications and paper presentations accredited to his wisdom apart from his 6 years of teaching experience at st michael's college he is also a youtuber with many innovative subjects and classes in his personal youtube channel naipunya is truly honored to have you with us today sir now without further ado let's get into the official event I invite you all to yet another vibrant session of the talk series. Kindly turn off your audio and video so as to not interrupt the session. Also, please fill in the attendance form given in the chat box and kindly fill the feedback form which will be provided towards the end of the session. I now invite Avani, final year BA student for the prayer song. കരുണ്യം കൈ വിളക്കായൊരു ജ്യോതിസി നേരായ മാർഗം നീ കാട്ടേണമേ ഇത്തിരി മുന്നോട്ട് പോകുവാനാ എന്റെ കൈ തിരി നാളം തെളിക്കേണമേ മുന്നിൽ പൊരുള Avani Now I would like to invite Dr Anuja Raj assistant professor Naipunya School of Management to deliver the welcome speech Hi good morning and a warm welcome to all the participants here It gives me immense pleasure to give the welcome note to our e colloquium talk series 3 on the topic deconstructing reality in the digital age i welcome our dear principal father bijo george pandembeli who always stood as a constant support for each of our new ventures i also welcome our dear head of the department mr xavier paul who can be called as the brain behind this talk series now i welcome our dear distinguished guest mr sam johnson assistant professor st michael's college and also a very dear friend of mine for having accepted our invite and for gracing this occasion with one of his luminary talks on deconstructing reality in the digital age it is a topic of contemporary relevance and i hope that all of you will profit from his talk next i welcome each of our participants for coming online on this day to make this talk series a very grand success thank you Thank you Anuja ma'am. Next I take this opportunity to humbly invite our respected principal Reverend Father Baiju George Pandambili to extend his warm wishes to grace this occasion. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning uh, Sam sir. Um good morning faculty uh, uh, members and all the participants of the day. Uh, I'm very happy to uh be a part of this uh, ecolocium conducted by the department of english naibunya school of management um so uh the topic which is taken for today's discussion is very relevant as we are facing a lot of distress in this covid and corona season so i wish uh, sam sir to enlighten all the participants with a 
his thoughts on his reconstructing reality in this distressed time and also the relevance of uh, literature uh, thinking in this season covid season also is important and the naibunya postgraduate department of english uh, has taken a lot of effort to make awareness among the students and all the participants uh, in the, during the previous ecolocium sessions so uh, in the name of management i welcome and also thank mr uh, sam professor tham sam for this uh, wonderful time with us and i wish all the best for the, all the participants and uh, wish a fruitful time along with him thank you thank you father now with the utmost gratefulness and pride i invite our guest of the day mr sam johnson assistant professor of st michael's college to awaken us with his wisdom through his talk deconstructing reality in the digital age good morning everyone at the very outset let me thank the management of nsm college chertala and the postgraduate department of english for having me here let me also thank all those who have joined with me here today what i would like to do today is share a few of my thoughts on the concept of reality in the digital age that we confront today i would definitely try to make this you know the least painful this surgery that i am about to do by cutting open your brains and uh, trying to implant uh, some of my ideas uh, whenever i you know talk about uh, implanting ideas to uh, surgery in classroom i get reminded of the canadian or the stephen leacock's famous story the man in asbestos it's a story that is set in futuristic time and you know i was especially impressed towards the way how education was attained in that particular futuristic time let me ask all the students who are or who have joined this meeting how many years do you spend to be an undergraduate in english literature or a postgraduate in english literature you spend like uh, 21 to 23 years to become an undergraduate or a postgraduate in stephen leacock story it happens in just 30 minutes you go to a doctor you fix an appointment you schedule your surgery and you get it done you become a master of the discipline that you have chosen in just 30 minutes if you have chosen geography you get the surgery done in 30 minutes and you come out as a master of that particular discipline how easy is that you can get rid of you know all the assignments test papers and semester evaluations you know, abuses from uh, teachers and parents alike you can get rid of the expectations of the society you spend like as i said earlier you spend like 20 to 23 years but in this story you, know, you get it done in just 30 minutes and that is a reality that we would really like to have now whenever i talk about implanting ideas i get reminded of this particular situation a reality that we would actually like to have sorry for that a little bit of digression there now uh, let's come back to our topic now i assure you this is going to be a boring lecture because i am going to share a lot of my a lot of you know eccentric ideas a lot of philosophy i really suggest you you know you take something to eat from the kitchen eating makes you feel good at the end of the talk you know uh, you'll feel a good vibe just because you ate something during the lecture and this is one good thing about webinars right? you can do uh, anything that you want to do and you you can still show that you have uh, attended the talk so please feel free now having said that you know we all know the actualities and uh, realities behind webinars we have this uh, perceived uh, reality under the experience of which 
Now we believe that we think that you know all the listeners are lured to the pedantic lecture that the resource person is giving that they can you know just take their eyes and ears of the uh, from the screening device that is in uh, front of you. You also have this supposed reality. All these realities I am narrating uh, with respect to uh, a webinar or this uh, webinar to be specific. So you have this uh, uh, supposed reality under the experience of which you think or believe that you, know, you just listen to an erudite lecture given by a person who has been researching this topic from his birth. Now I can even point out a third kind of reality, which is suppressed reality under the experience of which you know you would like to argue against the statement of facts being done by the resource person you know it inside you that you know what he's stating is not real you have that reality inside you but the problem is that reality never finds existence outside of you so what i'm trying to point out are you know the, the, the slew of realities that occur side by side in connection with an event which you think is a singleton event, the only reality. Now, if this webinar happened like 20 to 30 decades ago, uh, perhaps I could have agreed that, yes, this is the only reality. This is a singleton event. This is what can be termed as an overarching authoritarian kind of reality. Now, if this webinar happened like two or three decades ago, I could have said that now you are actually you know, personalizing this singleton event. You are subjectively experiencing this overarching authoritarian kind of reality. But unfortunately, you know, this webinar is happening on 31 10 2020, where we have you know, a slew of subjective realities where we have other types of realities that have crept in. Now, what is this overarching authoritarian kind of reality that I stated earlier? Now, I would like to quote the Malayalam writer, Deba Nishant, who you know, incorporated the condensed version of Octavio Paz's poem into the brain in the introductory part of one of her memoirs. And the lines are in Malayalam. I'll definitely explain it to you. The lines say, Vidulla vende malayella, vidilla vende. Kanunna vende malayella, kelkunna vende. Idirandu malla, kollunna vende. So, of course, it's about rain and how these people experience rain. Now, if you ask me what is that overarching kind of reality in this particular example, it is the rain and you have subjective experience of this overarching reality done by the one with the house the one without the house the blind person the deaf and the one who is in the rain you have this overarching reality being experienced subjectively which means that you have subjective realities Now you can argue that you know uh, this overarching reality is still present. Now what I'm trying to you know point out is that we have actually lost that ability to distinguish between what is real and what is unreal, or perhaps recognize that overarching reality. Now, are you sure that you are not watching a pre-recorded video? Are you sure? Because at the touch of a button, I can play another video. And if I am not satisfied this, with this particular video, I can play another one. You know how Google Meet works. You have to share your screen to share the video that you want to show. But right now, I haven't done anything. I haven't shared my screen. 
but I am playing another video. I can even bring one of my clones to do the job. I can bring this guy here to talk to you guys and I can just relax. And if I'm not satisfied with a singular clo clone, I can bring in another clone. You are indeed watching a live event, but I can manipulate that live event, that reality, by using a bit of technology. And you'd perhaps really want to know what is the reality or perhaps the software that I am using, which is what helped me to manipulate reality. And this is, you know, uh, uh, what has happened to reality. Now we have lost that ability to distinguish between what is real and what is real, if at all something like real and unreal exist. And that is exactly what I'm trying to deconstruct. Now, Derrida was true when he said that uh, people in general, they have this tendency to think in terms of binary opposition, black, white, absence, presence, conscious, unconscious, masculine, feminine, so on. And this was so true in case of reality. You had real and imaginary. What is real is not imaginary, and what is imaginary is not real. But this has changed in the digital age. And to understand this change, it's important that you, you know, go through the evolution of this concept called reality. And of course, yes, we'll do that with the help of literature. The very first name that you must have probably come across who made some sort of a reference to reality is Plato. His famous statement, poetry is twice removed from reality. It's in book 10 of his famous work, Republic, that he exiles poets and poetry from his ideal state. He made the statement that poetry is twice removed from reality. He substantiated his argument with the help of the carpenter and the chair imagery. Plato said, Carpenter, Carpenter had this idea of chair in his mind. And Plato calls this particular idea as the real, that which is original. And when this Carpenter made a chair, wooden chair, out of you know, the idea that he had in his mind, the end product that the carpenter had was already once displaced from reality. It became an imitation of the original or the real. And Plato says that when a painter paints a picture of the chair, which was made by the carpenter, what the painter does is he imitates an imitation. And the end product that the painter has, which is the painting, is twice displaced from reality because he imitated an imitation. The reference is sure uh, not to the concept of reality. The stress, the emphasis is not on reality. No, but an indirect reference is being made to reality, an objective kind of reality. Now, even Aristotle made you know, an indirect reference to the idea of reality that they you know, had back then uh, when he counter argued his master's argument. Plato was Aristotle's master. Now, Aristotle said, poets don't just imitate things as they are, but they imitate things as they should be. So again, you have a passing reference to reality being made there. Imitate things as they are. As I says, I would like to reiterate that statement that I made earlier, that it's not a direct statement on reality. It's not a direct reference. The, stress, the emphasis is not on reality, but 
Now, they made a passing reference. They made an indirect reference to give us, to tell us the state of affairs regarding reality, the concept of reality. Please don't be under the misimpression that it all began with Plato and Aristotle. We have uh, pre-Socratic philosophers who have made such passing references. We have Parmenides who is uh, who lived during 5th century BC. He is a Greek philosopher. Uh, he is associated with the school of metaphysics. Now, he said that the only things that don't change, or things which don't change are the only things that are real. Look at how he connected reality with whatever that he used to witness them. We also have a Sinophanes who lived during late 5th BC, yet another uh, Greek philosopher who said that everything is wrapped in appearances. So again, you know, all these examples, they suggest that you know, they did have an understanding regarding the concept of reality. Perhaps they were not too much concerned with that concept because you know what they had then was an objective view regarding reality where everyone has a common notion regarding reality. But still, you know, from these statements, from these facts, from these examples, we can understand that we can decipher that you know, they did have an understanding regarding the concept of reality. So when you come down to medieval age, uh, you know what happened during medieval age. You know they absorbed the classical elements. There was a rediscovery of classical elements, and they were more interested in theology. And that is why we have you know ideas like mysticism, uh, biblical criticism. We also have you know uh, miracle morality, mystery plays evolving during that particular period. When you come down to Renaissance and Neoclassical period, you know, even they did not meddle much with this concept. Even they had an objective view regarding this particular concept of reality. And even they believed that reality is the sum existent of you know, everything that is uh, real as part of a system, as opposed from things that can be called as imaginary. Romantic age, you know, what happened during Romantic age was they were they were so obsessed with the binary counterpart of reality, binary opposite of reality, which is imaginary, that some of them even theorized it. You know uh, how Wordsworth, you know, divided imagination into primary and secondary, how he distinguished be between uh, imagination and fancy. Keats' negative capability, you know, which states that uh, you can accept doubts you know, without reaching for the facts behind it. We have Coleridge who tried to make the ordinary extraordinary by you know, adding or you know, coloring it with some sort of imagination. So these romantics were too obsessed with the counterpart of uh, or binary opposite of reality. Now, from there, when you come down to uh, the Victorian period, uh, you can say that it's this particular period which actually paved the way for changes in assumption regarding reality. The rise of the novels, literary realism to be specific. Uh, though uh, not about reality, these writers wrote against the romanticized works which existed you know, in the preceding period. And when you think in terms of binary opposite, they did write about reality. Now let's come to the modern age. That is the period when you have so many movements, you have literary realism developing in the form of magical realism, surrealism, psychological realism, social realism. You have movements like ontology, idealism, physicalism, all this gaining prominence. Now, all these movements are not connected with reality per se. No, they were, you know, they concerned themselves with the representation of reality. That is when you know the, the, the writers, you know, felt the presence of that subjective kind of 
reality. A subjective way of experiencing the reality that is out there. And you can never argue that the subjective experience is fake or imaginary. Now we have writers like Robert Anton Wilson, now who uh, was a 20th century American writer uh, who wrote works like Nature's Goat, popular work, and that can which which can be studied you know, under this particular uh, title called Evolution of the Concept of Reality. Now he said that perception is reality. Life is how you perceive reality. And he even made the statement that. I cannot tell you what anything is, but I can tell you how it seems to me at present. So I don't think, no, I should give you another ex example uh, to explicate the idea of subjective experience of reality. Now, when he said, life is how you perceive reality, or perception is reality, and we know it very well that you know, perception depends on the individual. Now, this was also a time when uh, culture and a man's societal relationships were studied. And thus, we have you know, the popular uh, work Social Construction of Reality by uh, Peter Berger and Thomas Luckman. And this came out in 1966. And this is a work which you know, gave us this idea that the reality that we perceive is colored by our social background, our societal connections, our belief system. So there you have you know, an explanation to, in that particular work, we have explanation to how our belief system, the rituals we follow, the religion that we follow, the culture that we follow, the societal relationship that we, we you know, share, how they contribute towards forming reality. If we see that gradual shift, you know, the focus uh, is gradually shifting from representation of reality to the concept of uh, or the idea of reality as such. I'd also like to point out another writer in this regard, David Nowitz, who is a South African writer who wrote the work Knowledge, Fiction and Imagination. And this came out in the year 1989. And in this work, he stated that literature is an important source of knowledge regarding reality look at how he equated between literature or how he made a relationship possible between literature and reality he stated that literature is an essential source of knowledge regarding reality now mark turner an american linguist he accorded the same idea in his work reading minds that came out in 1991 when he said that literature lives within language and language within everyday life. Now, he did what David Novitz had stated earlier. He connected between literature and everyday life, which is our reality. And he did that through the medium of language. So these are some of the writers, you know, who helped in giving us that shift, that shift of focus from representation of reality to a discussion on the idea of reality as such. Now, if you ask me, who was uh, that uh, one writer who was so enchanted by the concept of reality during the modern period, then I would suggest it's Philip K. Dick, the American writer. Now, most of his works, you know, questioned, or you know, most of his novels uh, were a question on what actually constitutes reality. Now, would you like to know what if the allied powers lost and Axis powers won the world war, an alternate reality? Would you like to know? Uh, would you like to read about this alternate reality? Then perhaps you can read Philip K. Dick, the man in the high castle to be specific. Would you like to know, you know what happens when humans are not distinguishable from humanoids, which I'm sure is to happen in the future? Read Philip K. Dick. Would you like to know what our future reality is going to be? Read Philip K. Dick.
I say this because you know all that all those things that he narrated uh, through his novel are actually happening today. Artificial intelligence, a predictive algorithm, virtual reality, emotional robots, genetic engineering, manipulated memories, and so on goes the list. Now, all these he narrated in the novels that he wrote during 1950s and 60s. And we have realization happening here. We have, we see his ideas materializing today. So that is why I said, you know, would you like to know of our future reality? Go and read PKD. Now, I would like to quote some of the lines that he, you know, wrote in uh, the work title how to build a universe that doesn't fall apart two days two days later which came out in 1978 and he says the two basic concepts which fascinate me are what is reality and what constitutes the authentic human being he spoke about this in 1978 please do have that in mind over the 27 years in which i have published novels and stories i have investigated these two interrelated topics over and over again i consider them important topics maybe each human being lives in a unique world a private world a world different from those inhabited and experienced by all other humans. He is gradually coming into that subjective uh, sort of reality. And that led me to wonder if reality differs from person to person. And can we speak of reality as singular or shouldn't we really be talking about plural realities? Now, again, as you read further, you come across these lines. Because today, we live in a society in which spurious realities are manufactured by the media, by governments, by big corporations, by religious groups, political groups, and the electronic hardware exists by which to deliver these pseudo worlds right into the heads of the reader the viewer, the listener. This is what exactly I began with, the presence of you know, realities and pseudo-realities, our incapability to understand or distinguish between what is real and what is unreal. Now, some of the you know, literary figures of the of, uh, 20th century, they have tried to theorize this particular inability, inability to, dis to distinguish between what is real and unreal. They have tried to theorize this you know, fragmented, you know, multi-dimensional, fractured reality that we, you know, uh, confront in this, uh, at that particular period of time. For example, the French uh, sociologist Jean Baudrillard, he spoke about simulacra, simulacrum, and hyperreality. You know, he he believed that. Baudrillard, he believed that in postmodern culture, we have lost all contact with reality. We are in a process called simulation. And we reach a stage called simulacra where you have only copies, but no originals. You know, so as to have copies, we need originals. But he said that. Now we are in this process called simulation, whereby we would have only simulacra, copies without original. And he called this entire situation as hyperreal. And it is based on this belief that he said that you know the 1991 Gulf War did not happen. It was only a representation of war that was done by media. Look at how you know uh, 
theoreticians try to theorize or theorize uh, this particular idea or concept of reality. We also have, you know, uh, other theories. For example, uh, Robert K. Merton, who was an American sociologist, he brought out the idea called self-fulfilling prophecy. He said that even a false idea, a pseudo reality, can become real if it is acted on. I'll give you an example. Now, somebody who has an account in a particular bank, he, somehow he thinks that his bank is going to go bankrupt. So he, you know, takes away all his funds, and this news gradually spreads. So everyone, you know, they take away all their funds they had invested in the bank. Now this was, this began with a false notion, with a false idea. But once everyone take away you know, their funds from the bank, you know, definitely the bank is going to go bankrupt. So what started as a pseudo reality, it became real in the end. So this is what, theor what was theorized by Robert K. Merton. We have another you know, American theorist, W. I. Thomas, who brought out Thomas theorem. He says, now if you if you define a situation as real, then they are real by their consequences. It's only based on that consequence consequences that you can say that a particular situation, a particular event is real. Now I'd give you an example. Now if you label somebody as courageous, heroic, no, that person, no. Since he is repeatedly labeled as courageous and heroic, when a situation comes up, he has to be heroic or courageous. He might turn out to be a heroic, courageous person, in spite of the fact that perhaps you know this was never part of his character. So these are two, three theories that I would like to you know uh, point out in this discussion. Now the concept of hyperreality that I was talking about earlier, and the you know, the idea of a real without an uh, a copy without an original, or our inability to you know distinguish between what is real and what is unreal. Now this has been greatly explored in movies, movies like Matrix series, The Inception, The Truman Show. These are movies which have, you know, explicitly mentioned the crisis, you know, that I talk about. Now, I'd like to, you know, specifically point out a particular director. He is Kishi Matsuda, and he, you know, made this movie on virtual reality, which is worth seeing. I would definitely play that movie for you. It's just a six-minute movie, but it really points out what the future reality is going to be how we are gradually going to forget that singleton overarching authoritarian kind of reality i would like to play that particular movie for you and this time i'm definitely going to present my screen the way that we do it you know um, uh, in google meet Seguro que no hay más trabajo disponible. Estoy para ser profesora y estoy haciendo mercados. Y además, soy de ciudad de conocimientos de fidelización. Eres una noche afortunada. Tienes que confiar en la aplicación. Te sientes inspirada. Gracias. Chao. ¿Quién se echó? No, no es lo que quiero decir. ¿Para dónde voy? No. Puedo volver a empezar. Thank you. 
Buen día, Emilio. ¿Qué puedo hacer con usted? ¿Qué está pasando? Mis puntos están bien. No se preocupe. Sus puntos están seguros, Emilio. ¿Le puedo ayudar en algo más? Emilio, yo no soy Emilio, yo soy Juliana Restrepo. Por favor, espero. Hola, Me alegra ver. ¿Qué puedo hacer por ti? Mis puntos están bien. ¿Qué está pasando? Tranquila, todo está bien. Parece que alguien está intentando vulnerar su cuenta. Por favor, espere, reinicio su dispositivo. Hola, Juliana. Me alegra verte. Hoy te ves hermoso. ¿Estás estrenando zapatos? Ya lo arreglaron. Tengo que seguir trabajando. Estoy trabajando en eso, pero necesito verificar tu información biométrica. Por favor, sigue la línea azul hasta el centro de servicio más cercano para confirmar tu identidad. Sí, pero mis puntos están bien. Todo está bien. Chao. So, did you see how appealing virtual reality is? And at part, one particular moment, you get a glimpse of the real reality that is around the person. Did you notice how appalling it is with the baby crying with, you know, with all the color and all the beauty that was there on the screen, you know, they just vanished. This is why we have this, you know, different types of realities everywhere. You can have hyper real movies, you can have hyper real advertisements. You know, I remember a few, you know, you brush with a particular toothpaste, and once you do that, you can change a boring place into a you know wildly active one. Will that happen to you? You do this, you brush with a particular brand of, of toothpaste, and you just go out. Do you see things change? And that is why I call these you know ads as hyper real for these examples. You have soaps that say that you know it would improve husband wife relationship now all these are copies that have don't have original you you know go to a, you watch a particular news channel even they have this particular type of reality with them which is augmented reality they have all these graphics you know uh, people appearing you know, helicopters ships you know, whatever news that they are discussing now Now, with these types of realities in place, you know, uh, things have changed a lot. Instead of, you know, understanding or uh, understanding or seeking information, we have started experiencing information. We have started started to browse life rather than browse a website or web as such. We have uh, AR apps in uh, the latest smartphones. We did not have this earlier on, but as of now, we have you know, AR apps in mobile phones. You can have a lion in your room. You can check how a particular you know, furniture would, would, would look like you know, if it is kept in your room. You can paint your entire house and you can see how it would look in different shades. You can have a car which is actually not there in your space. You can you know, put it in your garage and see if it would fit, how the car would you know, match with the color of the house or, you know, whatever that you want to compare it with. You have 
Google Glasses that might be in future. You know, what Kishi Matsuda has stated through you know the uh, short film. You know, you have heads-up display in cars, which actually blends information with vision. Now, all these are you know what adds virtual reality or what you know attempts to cover up that you know authoritarian uh, overarching kind of reality that we had earlier and uh, i don't think if i should talk about uh, social media uh, the constructed realities that they are the you know uh, facebook uh, instagram uh, all those social media no, what they give you is an ameliorated version of the reality that you have around you, a modified version of uh, the reality that you have around you. I have written down a few examples, you know, uh, to consolidate or to substantiate my argument. You know, you can uh, convey your emotions in the best, you know, possible manner by using emoticons, by using GIF images. You can, even though that particular expression doesn't appear on your face, you can convey it to your friend. You can uh, respond and retaliate to experience of others in this particular space. You can narrate tales in the most artistic manner possible. You know, you can control your audience, which actually does not happen in the real world. If, if someone is talking to you, you have to listen to him. You cannot just mute him. But this happens in social media. So this is exactly why we prefer these alternate realities, these constructed realities. You know, Facebook reminds of your friend's birthday. Just imagine you forgot your, you know, siblings or your wives or your husband's or your friend's birthday. It's going to be a disaster, but Facebook actually helps you with it. You know, the social milieu, milieu that exists, you know, uh, in this uh, particular space that I'm talking about, is far better and appealing than the reality that we see around us and that is exactly why you know we uh, prefer this hyper real spaces anyone would like to be in kishi machida space just imagine if you had all these you know uh, gadget that could help you you know brighten up the space that you see the movie was a perfect example of how future is going to be or future reality is going to be and these days rarely do we find a person who you know does not have a smartphone which is actually the threshold or uh, starting point of this virtual reality so these are the, the realities that are popular today augmented virtual now you might have gone to 6D and 9D theaters you know, where you are given a perfect sensation of the virtual world. You have this VR headgear wherein which you know you can play games and you can be in another world. I don't have to point out how addicted you know uh, youngsters, even elders, were to the PUBG game. You know, they are introduced into a new world where you know things which are not possible in this real world are possible or become possible now uh, i'll move gradually move on to the conclusion part now it's not actually an exagger exaggeration to state that you know uh, this particular period or the modern digital period is dominated by virtual reality uh, mixed reality hyper reality and augmented realities i can even bring out alternate realities because you know you know people you know want to spend in such spaces you, know, you would definitely love to apply a filter to a photograph rather than just posting it you know as it is that's because you prefer something else that's because your projected image on such social spaces is different that is not the actual reality that we live in. We live in the virtual world offered by such constructed realities. You know, we might be like you know, Truman Burbank in The Truman Show or Dome in The Inception, two movies that I you know, uh, really like, which explicates this idea of reality. But the difference is that uh, Truman Burbank, he, he goes on this quest towards the end of the movie to you know uh, recognize that reality or to recognize that unreal environment which he was in and um, with respect to inception dome he had this totem with him 
by spinning this thought up he you know differentiated between the real and the unreal so perhaps now i can conclude by giving you this uh, statement which would actually you know perhaps help you to understand that uh, understand the domination that is being done by these you know other forms of reality around us you have an algorithm out there that understands you better better than perhaps your father and your mother you have an algorithm out there that understands you better than your father and your mother i don't think i have to explain that particular statement and it's very much clear that it is out there and remember that this was something that philip k dick talked about you know like uh, 60 to 70 years ago yes i would like to wind up on that particular note thank you for patiently listening to me i hope it was worthwhile i have shared only a few things that you know uh, that immediately came to my mind when i started pondering on this particular concept thank you so much for patient being patient and listening thank you sam sir for that wonderful session i'm sure that it was indeed a wise and thought provoking talk for all of us participants kindly note that the floor is now open for your queries you can post your questions in the chat box or ask sir via the audio participants are also kindly requested to fill in the feedback forms through the feedback link posted in the chat box now all the things i you know stated are things that you know you know i'm i'm very much aware uh, about it it's just that you know we are gradually moving away from that uh, authoritarian or arching kind of reality and the worst part whatever that you may call it is that you know uh, we know that we are moving away from this reality and this is something that we want you might ask your younger ones you might ask others to you know reduce your screen time or to stop playing games or you know not to involve yours too much uh, in social media but ultimately you find that even you are doing the same in one way or another it might be in front of the laptop or it might be in front of the tv screen or you might get yourself involved in a particular movie now, some way or other everyone you know they are being influenced by this dominating virtual reality now somebody has asked a question in uh, posted a question in the comment box could you please share your thoughts on the importance of reality over hyper reality or imitation now i wouldn't say that the reality is too important for you now, what is important is that you don't lose your connection with the reality that is around you now, what this virtual reality makes us do is that it's cut it cuts off that connection and it takes you to that extreme point where in which even though you have hyper reality around you even though you are surviving in a hyper real environment even though you are confronted with copies to which you don't have originals you will you know, barely be able to understand that you have come to that particular point now you might have read the news in which a boy played pubg for 14 hours continuously and he passed away that is our the, the kind of involvement that we have reached to you can do that for 14 hours without food without taking in water without being distracted by anyone in the family or anything that is happening around you you can be in that virtual reality so it's not important how in, uh, it's not you know what you need to focus is not on the idea that on the idea of reality as such but how you are moving gradually away from that reality into this space called hyper real
regarding the question that was posted by Marina, uh, thoughts about virtual reality that is presented uh, present in the teaching scenario presently. We are all, you know, uh, the, the, the motive is different with respect to the virtual reality that we teachers are in. The students, they have been in this space. All of us are not, you know, uh, kind of used to this particular kind of pedagogy, teaching learning process. And the motive of, you know, teachers, it's, it's different. What teachers want is to, you know, they somehow want to disseminate the knowledge. They somehow want to teach the topics that have been assigned to them. Now, this was not voluntary. This transition, this shift was not voluntary. And since it is not voluntary, since we are forced to take upon this virtual reality, I'm sure we'll find our way back. And somehow we teachers, especially uh, as teachers, we are you know, trying to get back to our regular classes where you can interact with the students personally, you know, where you can crack jokes, you know, where you can be you know, free with your topics, you know, where you don't have, you know, where you get live responses. That is what it keeps a teacher moving on. And that is what we have been restricted in this particular space. So since this movement is, you know, uh, something which was forced or thrusted upon us, I'm sure you know, we haven't lost, or perhaps we are even more reminded about the reality that we were in, the kind of good days that we used to have while you know, we used to, you know, personally go to the class and take the sessions. So uh, since this is something which is trusted upon us, I'm very sure we'll gradually get this away and we will definitely go back to that reality which actually, you know, teachers from the perspective of teachers that they want. Participants, any more questions? I think that's it. Perhaps it's only I who have a question. Did you get something from the day? Something out of the session? Uh, thank you so much for all the comments that you have shared there. I'm really happy that you took a moment to write them down. Yes. Yes, I have yet another question there from Vijesh. Uh, could you explain how easy, difficult is that movement from reality to hyper-reality? Now, when there's that movement is trusted upon you, perhaps it is slightly difficult. When that movement happens, you know, gradually, even without you noticing it, even without, you know, an, uh, an understanding of that transition, that is very easy. That happens with the purchase of a smartphone. That transition happens with the purchase of a smartphone. And once you have your smartphone, once you, you know, come across the numerous possibilities, once you come across the appealing spaces that you can actually access through that particular smartphone, yes, you know, that transition is going to be very, very easy. Perhaps you, were, you wouldn't even notice that you have come into the space. You are spending more time in your virtual space rather than your real space. I, I always experience this in my college. You know, when my students, they are at college, you know, they, what they like to do is they like to, you know, uh, spend time on their mobiles. When they are at college, they spend time on mobiles. And when they go back to their houses, you know, they, they chat with their friends. The friends who were sitting by them, the friends who were in their class, they chat with them once they go home. 
So we have made up this priority list. We have made our preferences. We give we give preference to this virtual space. Now, even you might have experienced that. You might be you know uh, giving out a smiley and emoticon, you know, which uh, says you are laughing out loud. But what would be the actual expression on your face? Now that is where we, we understand that we have lost that connection. In reality. You don't have that particular expression on your face, but on the other side, in the parallel universe that you are in, you have that expression. Thank you, sir. As we are nearing to the closure of the session, I'd now like to call upon Ms. Lilia Sara Abraham, Assistant Professor of Naipunya School of Management, to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you, Arundhati. Respected Principal, Vice Principal, my colleagues and my dear friends. On behalf of PG Department of English, I extend a very hearty word of thanks to each one of you present here. You, you, you have blessed us with your presence. We appreciate your valuable time kept aside for us from your busy schedule. I must mention our deep sense of appreciation for Mr. Sam Johnson for the session Deconstructing Reality in the Digital Age. It was a wonderful session, sir, and it, and it was really informative. Next, I would like to extend a very special thanks to Mrs. Anuja, Anuja Raj for the welcome address. I also wish to express my gratitude to our principal, Reverend Father Baiju George Putinpalli, for providing hardening support, which encourages all of us to perform better. I am very grateful to our head of the department, Savior Paul, for giving us an opportunity to organize this event. Also, I would like to thank our students, Arundhati Raj and Avanias, for your sincere efforts. Well done, students. Keep it up. As we all know, complete success can only be achieved when all the team members work in tandem. So I extend my big thanks to our PG Department of English, also Mrs. Anuja Raj and Ms. And Ms. Abhijit Radha Krishna for making this event successful. Thank you. So I guess we are done. Thank you so much once again. And all of you have a very nice day and a great lunch. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thanks to each one of you and bye.